and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. This morning we spoke about fellowship in general with all mankind. Uh, this lecture is about fellowship within our churches. Uh, first, actually, I like to define uh, four words that are related to the word fellowship or the word kinonia. And to understand these four terms from a Christian perspective, then we will see together how the ultimate fellowship actually in the divine liturgy. And by the way, the word liturgy uh, means the work of the people. Laos means people, urge means work. So people working together or praying together or uh, worshiping together. The first word that are related to fellowship, when we hear the word fellowship means there is a relationship, a relationship. So in the New Testament, what is shared in common is first shared because of the common relationship we all have in Christ. What makes actually people during the time of the apostle, everyone sells his position and bring the proceeding and putting at the feet of the apostle. It's not like communism, totally different. But because all of us, we are one in Christ, that's why we need to share everything. So this important relationship with one another in Christ is the foundation of fellowship. Uh, earthly fellowship or secular fellowship is founded based on common interest or human nature or physical ties like in a family. But this is not, not the New Testament fellowship. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, St. Paul says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So God called us to have fellowship in his Son, Jesus Christ. Because as I told you this morning in baptism, I actually not individual anymore, but I am member in the body of Christ. Uh, so, in the secular fellowship, it is an activity. But in Christian fellowship, it is a relation more than activity. So any activity that comes based on this relationship, we are bonded together, we are united together in the body of Christ. So people in the early church not devoted themselves to activities like attending spiritual meeting or going together to the church, but they are committed and devoted themselves to a relationship. And this relationship actually produced all these different activities. Think about it like marriage. Marriage is not about common activities. Marriage is about relationship and commitment to one another. Then activity is the outcome of this relationship. That is the Christian fellowship. It is not about activities together. It's not just activity we have meeting together. 
No, it is a relational relationship in Christ together. The second word is partnership. Partnership. So the first word, relationship. Second word, partnership. In Christian, uh, in, in Christian uh, fellowship, there is a partnership. And I'm sure you hear it in the Divine Liturgy when we say about, you know, the Bishop and the, the Pope, we will and his partner in the Apostolic Liturgy. And, and some people actually, they told us first, oh, it is not a, a good translation. Uh, we should say, and his partner in the apostolic service or apostolic ministry. What do you mean, partner in the liturgy? Actually, if I'm not partner in the liturgy, then I'm not partner in the ministry. How I cannot be a partner in the liturgy? And we can partake from the same body together, and then we are partner in ministry. So our partnership mainly is in the liturgy. We eat from the same bread, we drink from the same cup. And if we are not in communion, then we are not partners. If we are not in communion, we are not partners. That's why the correct translation is partner in the liturgy. Partner in. That is the main partnership. Uh, in the Bible, uh, the word partner used to refer both to secular and to Christian fellowship. Like in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 7 and 10, when we spoke about how James and John were partners to Peter and Andrew in, uh, as fishermen, this is secular partnership. But also it's used uh, in a spiritual sense. Like in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 23. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. And if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of God. So he used to hear the word partner. He is about Titus. He is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. So what's the difference between relationship and partnership? Relationship describes believers as a community. But Partnership describes the believers as the principles of an enterprise who are partner. Like in, in a business partnership, uh, there is objective and each one actually provides toward this goal or toward this objective. And at the end, all partners get profits from this object of this goal. In the same way, in a spiritual partnership, there is object, objective for us. What is the object? To glorify God, as St. Paul said, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink or do anything else, do it all for the glory of God. So we are partners together to glorify God. And you are united together in this community to glorify God. In the Divine Liturgy, we start by glorifying God and we conclude by glorifying God. The first thing I want to say in the Divine Liturgy, glory and honor, honor and glory to the All Holy Trinity, the Father and Son, to glorify God. As if Abona in the beginning of the Divine Liturgy bring our attention, the goal we assemble together today to glorify God. And after he make the three uh, co uh, 
في اسم الرؤوف من جي اف نوت فيرد بانتيكولاتوري في اسم الرؤوف من جي بوت مونوجينيس بليسيد بي جاتا فاذر بانتيكولاتوري بليسيد بي سوني بلاتا سان ان ان ذا ديكن سيز وان ذا هولي فاذر وان ذا هولي سان ذا كونجريجيشن شانت ان سيج وات ذو كسا باتري كي يو كي ويتش ميز جلوري تو جاد ذا فاذر اند ذا سان اند ذا هولي سبيريت ناو اند فور ايفر اند ذا ايج اوف ريجيس ايمي Then at the end of the Divine Liturgy, actually, the last passage in the Divine Liturgy is lead us throughout the way into your kingdom. Because after this, it is the introduction of the fraction, which is the beginning of communion. And the introduction of the fraction and the fraction and the confession, that is the beginning of the communion. But the end of the Divine Liturgy is when Adonis says, lead us throughout the way Uh, into uh, your kingdom. Well, I'm going to tell you, by this, your your holy name is glorified and blessed with your Son and the Holy Spirit. Peace be with all. So, Abuna, actually, in the, the divine liturgy, by saying you are glorified, blessed, and exalted with your only uh, with your beloved Son and with the Holy Spirit. So the conclusion is to glorify the Holy Spirit, to glorify the Holy Trinity, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and during communion, the whole congregation says, uh, praise God in all his sins. So when we commune together, when we assemble together in the divine liturgy, we are partners in the divine liturgy to praise God. That is the, the goal in front of us. We are here to praise God. And through praising God, we become one when we partake of his body and his blood. And through this oneness, our fellowship with one another is actualized. And what is a prophet? I told you in the business, there is a prophet. What is a prophet? Given for us, for salvation, remission of sins, and eternal life to those who partake of it. Uh, this partnership, begins on earth, but it will continue with us in heaven. Uh, and this partnership gives us uh, the inheritance of the kingdom of God. A partner owns something. If you are a partner in business, you own in this business. In Romans chapter 8, St. Paul spoke our partnership. And he said, starting from verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. So we have inheritance. We will inherit the kingdom of God. Inheritance means our own. If, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be also be glorified in him. So we need to understand again, the word fellowship, the Christian fellowship, means relationship as a community, who are related to one another, also who are partners with Christ. Uh, so a community of people bound together by our common life and the blessing that we share through our relationship with the Holy Trinity. Partnership describes how we are related to one another in this relationship. Partnership describes how we are related to one another in this relationship. The third word under the word fellowship is companionship. Companionship. So we spoke about relationship, partnership, companionship. Companionship, it happens through communication. You cannot have a companion with whom you never communicate. So communication is a very important point in any companionship. Uh, so the 
we can see the key ingredient in any companionship is communication. In any fellowship, we need to have communication with God and communication with one another. And the communication, I can say, it is a vertical communication and horizontal communication. Vertical communication with God and with the cloud of witnesses in the paradise. And the horizontal communication with one another in the body of Christ. This includes to assemble together as one body in the church. Also to assemble together in small groups or even to meet together one on one. Let me give you some references for each one. Assembling together as whole body, you can read it in Acts chapter 2, 42. Acts chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayer. So the whole community assembled together, listening to the teaching of the apostle, in fellowship, in prayer, breaking the bread, communion. So that is the fellowship as a whole body. Small groups, Second Timothy chapter two, verse two. That's easy to remember. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. When St. Paul said to Timothy, and the things that you heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. As we have like meeting with the servants, meeting with the deacons, meeting with the coordinators. So St. Paul is saying to Timothy, what you heard from me among you many witness, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is an example of, you know, assembling as a small group. One on one, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another as just as you also are doing. Edify one another, like when we do visitation. If you are a Sunday school servant, you go and visit one person and talk to him one on one. So all these are type of different style of communication on the horizontal level. Uh, also the horizontal communication is building one another uh, as we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 11 to 12. St. Paul told to them, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. It's like when His Holiness visit us here, or one of the bishops or one of the priests come and visit us here. You know. So this is how we build one another. As St. Paul told to them, uh, I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. But not only you will be established by the spiritual gift that I will impart to you, but I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of you and me. Another example, uh, sharing together in worship, sharing together in worship. I'm speaking about different examples of the horizontal communication, our fellowship with one another. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16.
the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So that's another way of communication when we share together in singing and, and praising the Lord uh, during the divine liturgy. Another example when we carry the burden of one another. When we carry the burden of one another, that's another type of communication. Like what St. Paul mentioned in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So we need to carry the burden of one another and to help one another. So this is different type of fellowship. As I told you, companionship and communication is a very essential element in fellowship. If we don't communicate with one another, then we don't have a, a true Christian fellowship. So we mentioned three words so far. Fellowship means relationship. We are related to one another. We are members of one another in one body. Fellowship means partnership. We are not related only, but we are partners together. Partners with Christ, we will inherit the kingdom of God, and partners together with one goal is to glorify God in our life and also the profit that we will get given for us for salvation, remission of sins, and eternal life to those who partake of him. And the third thing is companionship or communication with one another. And I said the communication happened at the same time in, in a vertical level between us and God and on a horizontal level. And I gave you different example on the horizontal, like assembling together as one body or assembling in a small group or meeting together one on one or building one another, sharing in worship and carrying the burden of one another. The last word under fellowship is stewardship. A stewardship is a steward is the one who manage the property of another. A steward is not an owner, but he is a manager. And all of us we are a steward. So as a stewards we must recognize that we all belong to the Lord. And God entrusted us with certain gifts. And these gifts, actually, we need to serve one another with these gifts. And this will strengthen our fellowship. They say gifts are like not a jewelry box, but like a tools box. Why? Usually we use jewelry to adorn ourselves, but tools to serve one another. So God gave you the gifts not for your own glory, not to adorn yourself with these gifts. But God gave you the gift as a steward to actually serve others with this gift. As we read in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We cannot be in fellowship without using our stewardship our gifts to serve one another. You need actually to know what are your gifts and how to use these gifts to serve others. In Romans chapter 12, St. Paul said, starting from verse 5, 
We, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. So who will decide which gift you will receive? And who, how many gifts you will receive? It is God. As St. Paul said, having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us. Let us use them. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So, St. Paul say, if we are members in one body, and God give us this gift, let us use the gift as good and faithful steward to serve one another. I cannot keep the gift for myself, or I cannot hide the gift or bury it. The, the steward that took the one talent from the master and buried it, he told him, lazy and wicked servant. You need to know what are your gifts and how to use them to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. Otherwise, we are not in fellowship. So if we understand these four areas in fellowship, I cannot be, we are in fellowship if, I'm not, if I don't feel I am related to all of you. I'm related to all of you because I am part of the body of Christ and you are part of the same body. We are related and we are connected with one another. We eat from the same bread and we drink from the same cup. Also, we are partners, partners put together, not just who are related, but who are partners together, partners in praising God and in glorifying Him. And as I said this morning, all of us together, we will reflect the attribute of God, the light of Christ, the light of God to the whole world. And number three, if we are in fellowship, we need to communicate. Communicate with God, that's the vertical level, and communicate with one another. And the last point, as a steward, each one received gift from God, so let us serve one another with this gift as good and faithful steward. Then, as I said, the application or of the ultimate fellowship is in the uh, divine liturgy. In divine liturgy, actually, these four elements are fulfilled. All of us, we, st we stand together and we greet one another with a holy kiss. Means we are related to each other. We are members in the body of Christ. And we are partners in worshiping and praising God. And we communicate with God and we communicate with one another during the divine liturgy. Communicate with God in, in, in our prayer and with one another like when we greet one another with a holy kiss or when we pray for each other during the divine liturgy. The deacons actually says several times, pray for the peace of the church, pray for our patriarch, pray for the clergy, pray for the salvation of this holy place. This prayer is a type of communication with one another. And also, as a steward, we use our stewardship in, in glorifying God. Those who chant, those who read, those who preach, those who teach. So, in, in divine liturgy, indeed, it is uh, the, the ultimate fellowship. Beside in the divine liturgy, it is a fellowship in the suffering of the Lord and His resurrection. 
As the Lord said, and I'm going to quote it in the Divine Liturgy, for each time you eat from this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim my death, confess my resurrection, and remember me till I come. What does it mean? Is it just, why each time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup? I can remember the passion of the Lord and his death at any moment. And I can remember his resurrection at any moment. Why in the divine liturgy? Yes, in divine liturgy, we live it. We not just remember it in our mind, but we live it. How we live it? How we live it? When we partake from the broken body, and when we drink from the blood that was shed for our sake, we actually uh, participate in the passions of the Lord. And that's why the Lord said, take eat this body which is broken for you. Take drink this blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. In the divine liturgy, the body on the altar is the crucified body. That's why the body is made with uh, yeast. Yeast is a symbol of sin. Jesus Christ lived his life without sin. But on the cross, he carried our sins. That's why this sacrifice is the sacrifice of the crucified Lord. And that's why the body is given separate from his blood, because this body was shed. And there is emphasis that the body is given separate from his blood, because this blood was shed. That's why the Lord said, take it this is my body, take drink, this is my blood. And even in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, when St. Paul said, I deliver to you what I received from the Lord, that on the night of his passion, he gave his body and said, take eat, this is my body, and then give his blood. So two different actions, two separate actions, body and blood, because that is the crucified Lord. So when we partake from his body and we drink from his blood, it's a participation, fellowship in the passion of the Lord. And also this body is a life-giving flesh. So we who are under the sentence of death because of our sins, when we eat from his body, he gives us life. Abuna at the end of the divine liturgy says, I believe, I believe, I believe. This is the life-giving flesh, given for us for salvation, remission of sins, and eternal life. That's why every time we partake of his body and his blood, we live his passion and his resurrection, both his passion, death, and resurrection, because it is a crucified body, and, and the, the same body rose from the dead. So that's why the Lord said, for each time you eat of my bread, uh, of my body and drink of my blood, actually you remember my death and confess my resurrection. So it is a, a real fellowship in the passion of the Lord and in his uh, resurrection. Uh, and if you notice when Abuna breaks the body, he breaks the body into how many pieces? 13 pieces. Why 13 pieces? Jesus Christ, the head, and the 12 pieces are like the 12 apostles or the 12 tribes of Israel, it symbolizes the church. So in communion, the, the, the Eucharist make the body one with the head. We are the body and he is the head of the body. So when we partake of his body and drink his blood, we are one, that's fellowship, our fellowship with uh, the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. 
that's why the Eucharist sometimes we, we call it partaking. And I told you the word partake, partner or partake is an important uh, description of the fellowship. So we partake. وبالعرب احنا نسموه سر الشركة سر الشركة So the fellowship is the the ultimate expression of the fellowship is in the divine language I remember when I was young and used to spend uh, some time in the summer in Upper Egypt, visiting my grandparents. On Saturday night, I noticed the person who makes the urban, the bread, Samul Arabi. He used actually to go from one house to one house to collect the flower from the people. And I was surprised, and I asked him why yeah, people cannot donate to the church and they take, get the money and buy the flower that he wants. Or why Muslim this week he takes flower from this house, next week take the flower from another house and so on. Why he goes to each house and take flower from them? And the answer that I got the time, which reflect uh, a beautiful understanding of the fellowship and the divine liturgy. I was told, so this flower, the Urban and Hamal who will be baked from this flower, each family, each believer will be represented in this Urban that will be the body of Christ. So when Abuna says, remember, O Lord, those who brought to you these gifts, and those on whose behalf they have been brought, and those by whom uh, they are being, being brought, you know, so everyone will be represented. So this body actually, this Urbana, will have flower from each family, from each person. So each person is represented in the body of Christ. Because the, the offering, it is offered in the name of everybody, on behalf of everybody, by everybody. Again, the offering of Eucharist, the offering of Eucharist, is offered in the name of everybody, on behalf of everybody, and by everybody. Another thing that brings us in, in fellowship during the Divine Liturgy is the readings. When all of us, we listen to the same readings, then all of us will have one mind. Yani, uh, in two days, we'll read the Gospel of the Prodigal Son. So each one of us will be thinking about the prodigal son and the message from this parable. So in the divine liturgy, we will have one mind because we listen to the same readings together. The holy kiss is a sign of our fellowship with uh, one another. Uh, And the Didascalia in, yeah, emphasizes the importance of attending the liturgy regularly, regularly, to the extent in the, uh, the Didascalia said, he who is absent from the divine liturgy without excuse, as if he is amputating part from the body of Christ. All of us who are the same body, 
So if I'm absent, then the body actually is missing certain part. It's very important to attend together. One of the council called Council Sardiqa, a camera number 11, it says, he who is absent for three Sundays should be prohibited from taking communion. We are the body, the members of the same body, how can I be absent? If I am absent, then the body of Christ will be missing certain parts. Another thing is our participation in, in singing. Yeah, when you look at the Divine Liturgy, it says the people, the congregation, <laughs> chant and sing. Sometimes we are not participating. We are just silent in the liturgy, and this is not right. Our communication with one another and with God should yeah, be emphasize it in the divine liturgy when you respond. If your response is very easy for each other to, to participate in it, like Lord have mercy. Why, why you not respond when the deacon says pray for the peace of the one who won't be holy uh, of the good situation of God? Why you, why you not respond and we say uh, Lord have mercy? We need to participate with one another. Uh, also, participating when uh, the deacon gives us instruction, when the deacon say, pray for the salvation of this holy place, pray for the air of heaven, pray for uh, those who brought these gifts today. If you don't listen to this and you respond by lifting up your prayers, then you lift up your heart by prayer, from the peace of the church, from the Pope, from for the clergy, then you are not in fellowship. Can, can you imagine if all of us we prayed together for the peace of the church? When the deacon says pray for the peace of the church, all of us we prayed for the Pope at the same moment. All of us we prayed for the clergy. How powerful our church will be. So if you need to practice a true fellowship. It is in the divine liturgy. And in this morning, I told you about the importance of going and start a fellowship meeting. But to know whether this meeting has a true fellowship or not, this meeting should lead to the divine liturgy. Any meeting you have, or you are coordinating, and does not lead to the divine liturgy, is not a, a, a true meeting. The, the, the right meeting uh, that leads to a true fellowship should actually lead all the, the, the attendance to the divine ministry. Yeah, I mean, any ministry in the church should start from the divine liturgy and ends at divine liturgy. Yeah. Any service, Sunday school, uh, uh, any service, should start from the divine liturgy from the altar and at the end, bring the people to the divine liturgy. You take the grace from the divine liturgy, and at the end, you bring everybody back to the divine liturgy. I'd like to conclude by the introduction of the litany of peace that the Mona prays in St. Lisa liturgy, when he says, make us all worthy, O our Master, to partake of your goals unto the purification of our souls, bodies, and spirits, that we may become one body and one spirit, and may have a share and inheritance with all the saints who have pleased you since the beginning. Confined in this part, the relationship, one body, one, uh, one spirit, we can say the partnership will partake of your bodies unto the purification. We can see the profit and the purification of our souls, bodies, and spirit. We can see the communication on the vertical level and on the horizontal level. And you can see also our stewardship and our responsibility toward the edification of the church. So 
This actually, as I told you, the ultimate expression of our fellowship is in the divine liturgy. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.